ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm Paddy Tillett, President of the City Club. Welcome to our Friday Forum on the health of our central city featuring Kim Kimbrough, President and CEO of the Association for Portland Progress, and Don Mazziotti, Executive Director of the Portland Development Commission. But first, as usual, some announcements. On Friday, April the 19th, join us for a special program on education, which will focus on building community support for K-12 reform. Our guest spe speaker will be Dr. Sonia Hernandez, who is President and CEO of LAAMP Learn Regional Education Reform Alliance in Los Angeles. We'll also have a presentation and a vote on the club's tax ref reform report that day, so the program will begin at 11.45. So please plan to arrive early. That will be here at the MAC. In this week's bulletin, you'll find advance registration coupons for our two-part drug wars program on April 26. That's a, a, a breakfast and luncheon uh, uh, presentation. There are also coupons for the special breakfast and lunch gubernatorial forum on Wednesday, the 1st of May, featuring former governor Vicar Tia and five of the six major gubernatorial candidates. Basically, the candidates will be given a, a gubernatorial challenge at the breakfast meeting and will have to present their responses to it at luncheon. So it's a sort of trial by fire for the candidates. This will take place at the Hilton Hotel, as I say, on Wednesday, the 1st of May. Advanced registration and prepayment is due by Friday, April the 19th. That's next Friday. So please um, do take care of that quickly. Check our website and the bulletin or call the club office for more information and remember that you can now make luncheon reservations online. You can also receive your weekly bulletin via email, thereby saving paper and postage, I might add. If you prefer an electronic version of your bulletin, please leave your card and email address with a staff member as you leave or call the club office. Anyone interested in obtaining a video or an audio tape of this or any other City Club program may do so through the club office Video tapes are $20, audio tapes are 10. Call Suzanne at the club office for more information. As I mentioned last week, the City Club's Growth Management and Environment Committee has decided to make a return trip to Vancouver, British Columbia for the purpose of learning more about how Vancouver deals with growth issues. Planning Director Larry Beasley and City Councillor Gordon Price, both of whom have spoken at Friday forums, have agreed to meet with the group. The trip will take place over the weekend of June the 1st, and you can find detailed information on the flyers on your tables or by asking City Club staff. Our board host, seated at the far end of the table, is Kurt Krause, familiar to many of you, member of the Board of Governors. He will have the privilege of asking the first question of our speakers. Following Kurt's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Please line up behind the microphone before Kurt has finished so that you're ready. Please identify yourself as a member of the City Club and ask your question concisely. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Portland General Electric, from CH2M Hill, and from Providence Health Systems, and we are very grateful for their support. Today, we have the unusual opportunity to hear from two leaders who have enormous influence over the well-being of our city. Both have been in place for about a year, and both have already experienced dramatic changes in their agencies. Don Mazziotti returned to Oregon in 1997 as the state's chief strategist on technology to Governor Kitzhaber. He went on to become executive director of the Portland Development Commission last May. Back in the 70s, he worked at the Portland Bureau of Planning, then moved to Washington, D.C. in 1978 as deputy assistant secretary of transportation. He went on to put his degrees in planning and law to work teaching development law, advocacy planning, and citizen participation at the University of Iowa. Before returning to Oregon, Mr. Mazziotti headed his own development consulting firm in Pennsylvania. He also served as acting Secretary of Commerce to the Pennsylvania governor and was the founding director of the Pennsylvania Business Roundtable. With 30 years of executive and management experience in both public and private sectors, Don Mazziotti was told that he's expected to take PDC to the next level in its evolution, and I'm told he didn't even flinch. Kim Kimbrough took over the helm at the Association for Portland Progress in January 2001, and is now steering it towards amalgamation with the Chamber of Commerce, and will head that joint body. 
in July, I believe. The mission is beneficial growth and development in the central business district through the collaborative practice of public policy, business development, marketing, and public space management, all on the behalf of area businesses. Mr. Kimbrough has been managing business improvement districts and leading downtown revitalization efforts for the past 16 years in St. Louis, Missouri, Jackson, Mississippi, Roanoke and Franklin, Virginia, and Panama City, Florida. He served two terms as president of the Missouri Downtown Association and two terms as president of the Virginia Downtown Development Association. Since 1993, he's been on the board of directors of the International Downtown Association. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kim Kembra and Don Maciati. Thank you, Patty, for such a kind introduction. Um, and Kim, um, I'm going to do a long introduction if that's okay with you. It's just great to be here. I'm so flattered to uh, be asked to come and speak to the City Club. Um, I was speaking briefly with Joey Pope and she was thanking me for coming and I told her, you know, when someone's asked to speak to the City Club, they accept the invitation. Uh, and I'm the one who is flattered to be here, especially I, as I look uh, over this audience and see so many friends and also so many people that in the short 12 months that I've been at the PDC job who've actually helped me or given me advice, uh, I appreciate it very much. It's uh, been extremely helpful. I want to also recognize that as I look out, I see a whole uh, phalanx of uh, PDC folks uh, who I appreciate being here very much. They did pay their own way, so that uh, you know, want, want you to know that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about downtown Portland, um, as that is one of the focuses of the Portland Development Commission. And I think the challenge of the assignment that Joey asked me to carry out is that there is no formula, there's no clear uh, universal method for evaluating the health and vitality of a downtown area. Uh, we can look at statistics, uh, we can look at uh, a number of common factors. We can compare ourselves to others, which I've done a bit and will explain to you. But, you know, the bottom line in the end is that it's all about how we feel about the place that we live, as uh, Renee Mitchell pointed out uh, today in her column, as a matter of fact. Um, are we proud of our downtown? Are we proud of our city? Uh, are there jobs for our children uh, to be found there? Do we patronize the businesses? When people come visit, do we take them there? Um, those are some of the most important measures. And maybe most importantly, do we care enough to become involved in the affairs of our central city or our downtown, like so many of you uh, have been involved for so many years? Well, in the next few minutes, I'd like to talk a, a bit about uh, those questions and hopefully answer some of them uh, with you. Uh, first, though, I'd like to take a look back at uh, a little bit of Portland history, because I think it, history teaches us a lot about what we can do uh, in the future. We've uh, reaped huge benefits in the investments of the past. For example, at the Portland Development Commission, uh, we recently took a look back at some of our older renewal districts, uh, the downtown waterfront and uh, South Park Block uh, districts that many of you are familiar with. These were first designated by the city as renewal districts in the 1970s, and they included some of the biggest and most important projects of the Development Commission. Waterfront Park, the Marriott Hotel, Pioneer Courthouse Square, Pioneer Place, River Place, hundreds and hundreds of housing units in the city's west end, uh, and many other downtown projects. When those urban renewal areas were first designated, nearly three quarters, 75% of the buildings in those areas were worth less than the land they stood on. Today, 25 years or so later, those same buildings and many new ones are now worth four times the value of the underlying land. An incredible measure of success of downtown Portland and the people who have uh, worked on its development. With the revitalization of downtown, a lot of other things improved. Crime, for example, took a dive. 
decreased by 65% in downtown since 1990 alone. A dramatic change in the nature of our downtown area and one which defies a lot of popular mythology. And those are just some of the benefits. Uh, we have new parks, new transit systems, new offices, new jobs, new school buildings, new investments of all sorts contributing to today's vitality. The real question is, how long can we rest on those great achievements? How truly healthy are we today? And what do today's indicators show about the future? How can we maintain and build upon downtown Portland's strengths? Well, to answer those questions, uh, I'd like to provide you with a kind of report card for downtown Portland. Uh, based on a whole variety of factors, not scientific, more art than anything else, like, much like Renee Mitchell wrote about, and tell you some of the things, some of the ideas that we have for building upon downtown's underlying strength. And Kim will talk about uh, the more specific areas of focus, in particular our downtown retail strength. I've also provided you, if you note at your table, with a report card. Um, actually, this came, this is a, an old copy of an old report card from one of our employees. I didn't reproduce her daughter's uh, card, but I can tell you it was very, very good. Um, We'd like you to, if you have a moment, to rate downtown Portland according to these categories that we've created. And if you want, you also have the opportunity to rate my performance um, on the right-hand column. We've also provided you with a blue sheet that uh, describes some of the comparisons that we make between Portland, Denver, Cincinnati, Minneapolis, and a variety of other cities with whom we've compared our performance. So let's take a look at how we compare with other U.S. cities. In terms of retail sales, the, in that area of retail sales, which you'll hear more about later, Portland shows very strong performance. With 1.9 million square feet and $550 million in sales, Portland is on an equal footing with cities like Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Austin, and other great American communities. In addition, the Portland retail figure is projected to grow by about 33% in the next 10 years or so, far outstripping most central cities in the United States. Office vacancy rates, a somewhat different story, show Portland in the last quarter of last year far ahead of others in terms of positive performance of occupancy of uh, commercial and office space. At the end of that quarter, we were at 5.6%. Now everyone knows now that story has changed. We're at 14.6% vacancy in our downtown uh, office space. But I can tell you that most comparable cities now, if we had those figures available, would be reporting 20, 22, 25% vacancy. A significant difference and a reason for investing in downtown Portland. How about downtown employment? In the area of jobs, the Central City Business District uh, in Portland has 110,470 or so jobs and is on par with Denver and Sacramento and has more than Cincinnati. We have fewer jobs in our downtown uh, than powerhouses like Seattle, Phoenix, and Minneapolis. And arguably, we've seen very little change in that total number over the last decade or so. For those who work, shop, or recreate in downtown Portland, our ease of access, that is the time it takes to get to downtown from anywhere in the region, is very high, very positive on a national scale with an average time of 22 minutes. Only Austin and Salt Lake perform better than Portland in this category. So we lead all other cities in the convenience of access to our downtown area. I know it doesn't feel like that in the morning when you're on Highway 26 headed east. Uh, I do that myself, uh, coming from a point near the zoo. But you know, uh, it takes me eight minutes to get to work, eight minutes to get downtown. As to security and safety, uh, both violent crime and property crimes, as I reported, have declined. They've declined about 60% since the mid-90s in downtown Portland. But according to national crime statistics, Portland still scores low 
on this performance indicator with other cities of similar size. Portland's crime rate at 5.2% is the same as that for Houston, but it really is slightly worse than a number of other cities with whom we would compare ourselves. So there's improvement to be made there. Number of housing units is an important measure of the vitality of any area, and particularly downtowns today. And while housing units and their counts can be very misleading because different cities define their downtown area differently, in Portland, we did a downtown housing study recently, and it showed that in the area defined largely by I-405, the river, and North Burnside, or Burnside at the north, that area has about 8,375 housing units. If we were to add the river district, or sometimes called the Pearl District, that is the area north of Burnside, the estimate would jump to about 11,700 units. And we anticipate that within the next several years, we'll add about 6,000 more to that area alone. Now, this is significantly more housing than downtown Denver, Pittsburgh, Austin, and nearly on par with much larger cities like Seattle. But the cities of Cincinnati, Sacramento, and Salt Lake claim to have 15 to 16,000 units in their downtowns. My guess is, is that those numbers are for a land area much larger than downtown Portland. And if we did expand our definition to encompass the Lloyd District, Goose Hollow, and Lower Albina, uh, the number would come to about 15,600 units. We have as a target uh, the addition of at least 2,500 new market units and as many as 1,200 uh, lower and low in middle income units uh, over the next several years. On the tourism scale, how do we rate? Well, although we get about 7 million visitors a year, and we can boast that we have more restaurants per capita than any other city in the United States, we still are about in the middle of the scale when it comes to downtown hotel rooms. Uh, Portland has about 5,000 rooms in the CBD. And I know everyone thinks we have too many hotels, but the reality is, uh, while this is better than Sacramento and Cincinnati and Austin, it's far less than Denver, Minneapolis, Salt Lake, and Seattle. Now, this is an extremely important uh, economic driver. It's one when you consider uh, that visitors to our area add about $1.7 billion uh, to the local economy as they visit uh, our city. They generate an annual payroll locally of about $481 million, and their importance uh, should not be overlooked. What we do need to do very seriously in the near term is to add a 800-room convention center hotel on the east side so that we can attract uh, more of those visitors to our, our central business district. In the matter of parks, everybody knows that Portland has more parks per square inch than any city in America, and that statistic holds up. We have 19 uh, acres of land for every 1,000 people, and we perform better than Seattle, Houston, Salt Lake, Denver, Sacramento, and most communities. How about civic involvement? Maybe the most important measure of success. Well, that livability factor is not one that I could find a measure for uh, anywhere, but I suspect you know the answer. In PDC's 40-year history, actually 43, I think, the agency and the city have been able to accomplish some pretty amazing things. But one thing is for certain. We did not do it alone. And indeed, not, nothing that I've described to you, none of the great accomplishments of the city have ever been accomplished by one leader, one organization, one idea. They've been accomplished by people working together. And indeed, none of the work that I've described to you would have been possible with the kind of civic involvement or without the civic involvement that we have. So my gut feeling is that Portland in this area gets an A, maybe an A+. Plus not only in the downtown with organizations like the Chamber and APP, but in our neighborhoods as well. And so, looking overall, what's our grade for downtown Portland? And I'll be interested in your grade as you turn those into us. I'd give it a B plus. I think that's where we are realistically compared to other downtowns in America. And yes, we have a good downtown. Some would argue we have a great downtown, and I think we do. But we're at a critical point in downtown Portland for a variety of reasons, and Kim will talk a bit about those. We're at a point that has been called by some 
and by a good book recently given to me by a good friend, The Tipping Point. And The Tipping Point says that there just are a whole series of small incremental pieces that largely explain great things. And I think that's kind of where we're at in Portland right now. A whole number of small but very important challenges and opportunities that we need to seize and act upon rather immediately. We need to discontinue a few things. We need to stop the debate about the need for housing and get on to the business of building housing for all incomes in all places in the downtown. Second, we need to maintain the downtown's economic vi viability and vitality. We need more housing. We need more people. We need more jobs, and we need it now. Third, we need to look at how to further open the downtown to the river, how to take advantage of one of the greatest, most beautiful resources the region has to offer. And indeed, Commissioner Francisconi and the Parks and Recreation folks and, and the whole City Council are focused on that mission, and we're with them. Lastly, in our efforts to strengthen Portland's downtown, we need to look specifically at the retail core. Retailing has changed and is changing dramatically. And as we come out of the recession, the retail that we see will not resemble in many ways the retail of the past. It's absolutely essential that we have a strong retail sector in our community in the downtown. Let me leave you with a restatement of my main premise today and on an operating basis. Notwithstanding our great report card, the city is at a turning point in the downtown. We've got to be prepared to take some bold new steps and have some incremental successes on the many small challenges that face us, the pieces that need to be put together. The city followed a very sound course in the past, but there are things we have to do now to lift it up. Drift is the greatest enemy of downtowns or development in general, and we dare not drift. We dare not be uncertain about where we're going, where we're headed. And one of the people, one of the leaders that will help us understand where we need to go is Kim Kimbrough and the Association for Portland Progress and the successor to that organization, the Portland Business Alliance. With that, Kim can do the heavy lifting. Thank you, Don. Um, I have to say in, in, uh, in opening that um, Don's benchmarks are ex right on target, and we do score extremely well here in Portland. Um, I can sum up in a few words, to some extent, some of the, the high praise that he reaped on downtown, and that is you really can't have a great city without a great downtown. There is no example in, on this globe of that occurring. Um, Portland is, is clearly a leader in that regard in many, many ways, and we are very fortunate. Retail is one of those areas that um, many of us remember from um, days gone by, um, experiences with uh, grandparents, parents, loved ones, uh, uh, holiday season, beginning of school, whatever it may have been, um, where retail was king, if you will, in every uh, downtown in every city just about in, in North America. world has changed in an awful lot of places. Uh, Portland is ever so fortunate that we do ha still have an extremely strong and viable uh, retail core. Um, and actually, I would argue it, it's more than just strong. It, it really is doing quite well. However, and I'm going to talk about the however, um, there are some substantial challenges that have to be met if we're going to maintain this vitality and vibrancy that we have with regards to retail. Um, I, I actually heard a speaker in a uh, conference I attended, and I don't remember who he quoted this, the source he quoted this to, but I, I, having been in, in uh, practically every city in uh, North America that's 100,000 or more, and, and many of those several times, uh, I would have to agree with his statement that was... Uh, with the exception of, uh, of Manhattan, downtown San Francisco, there's no better retailing environment than downtown Portland. I found that quite staggering. Um, that didn't just happen for many of the reasons Don just mentioned. Let me give you a quick snapshot of what retailing is really doing in downtown Portland today. The retail core, 
which is essentially that area uh, south of Burnside to just uh, north of Market, uh, running from uh, 10th Street uh, to the river, is currently doing and recognized this, we don't have a sales tax in the state, as we all know, so there's not, a, not an easy way to quantify this, but we, this, this information is, uh, uh, we believe, is from industry sources and is, is fairly accurate. $550 million in, in sales last year in that area I just described. Now, that, obviously, there's a larger downtown where that number will go up. That's essentially what we refer to as the core from a retail perspective. Within that same area, there's 1,175 retail businesses. That's a, that's a number much larger than most of us would have guessed. The number of, uh, the amount of retail square footage in that, that area, which again is a subset of the whole, the, the larger downtown inside the interstate loop, uh, is 1.9 million square feet of retail space. You can add almost a million more if you take all of types of retail inside the 405 loop. The number of, of employees employed in the retail industry uh, in downtown is just under 13,000 full-time. That doesn't account for the seasonal folks that come on during the peak periods of the year. Let's also remember um, that, and I, most of you, those of you that are retailers, I'm sure know this well, but this is a, retailers contribute substantially to our tax base locally. Retailers pay 14% of the gross amount that's paid for to the BLT or BIT to the city and the county. That's the business income tax, if you will. Um, only behind, they are the number two payer by industry, only behind professional services. It is a huge economic engine. As goes retail, so goes the health of the tax base of this city in a lot in, in a lot of part, a lot of ways, especially when it relates to those discretionary dollars that our, our public officials at the city and the county make choices with. Considering the current and, and um, national and local recession and the expected up upturn by the end of this year, I, our consulting group and our study um, that, that we are just concluding, it finds that downtown Portland um, will likely increase its total retail volume from the 550 million in the core, of re uh, core retail area that, we curr that currently exist to between 600 and 610 million by 2005. That's if we do the things that I'm about to outline that are coming, that we are being recommended by this downtown uh, retail strategy. This uh, approximate 10% increase of 50 to 60 million dollars uh, indicates that existing downtown retailers will have greater opportunity to improve performance and landlords will be able to reduce vacancies over that same time period. Over the longer term, demand growth will continue. Our findings forecast that downtown Portland has the potential for approximately 200 million in additional retail sales growth beyond, in the decade beyond uh, 2005. To realize this level of volume increase, new retail development in the 600,000 to 650,000 square foot range will be required. Since the current inventory of re retail space in the core of downtown is 1.9 million square feet, the additional 600 to 650,000 square feet represents uh, about an increase of about a third. That really is substantial. I, I would uh, point out now, before I, I really switch gears pretty quickly and talk about the um, some of the specifics of the uh, recommendations. Let me talk about the constraints that we, all, we identified and we agreed upon. Current market conditions uh, will likely continue to slow with regards to national fashion retailers seeking flagship locations, especially those that yet to locate anywhere on the West Coast. Um, opportunities to accommodate uh, larger format stores within the existing uh, downtown building stock is limited due to the 200 by 200 uh, foot block size. Portland could be considered a remote city and in fact is by many of these national retailers that are looking for multi-store locations primarily because uh, it's not served by the, a regional distribution center. Um, the current income base of downtown residents is not strong enough 
um, like it is in other successful downtown retail cores, San Francisco, New York, um, to support uh, an overabundance of these newcomers to the market. Um, this might be a, an obstacle in attracting fashion retail tenants. However, um, our team and, and our um, steering committee believe that having a downtown residential component uh, and growing that will be uh, very attractive um, to the mid-priced local and regional tenants that serve a wider audience, including tourists and residents and office workers. The, we've also identified uh, some opportunities um, that are kind of baselines for the recommendations, and those are that uh, additional housing uh, will create demand for additional shops and services. Um, Although near term, uh, three to five year demand shows no potential for further development of uh, store, the department store or larger fashion, fashion specialty unit expansion, the team believes that Portland could absorb one or two additional department stores or large fashion specialty stores uh, in the longer term. Downtown benefits from having a number of fashion's leading vendors already here, Saks Fifth Avenue, St. John's, Jessica McClintock, and local merchants, Mercantile, Mario's, just to name a couple. Um, Portland has been recognized as a center, as Don mentioned, for um, regional cuisine and a community that acknowledges and supports its many, many restaurants. Um, success likes success. That's a huge opportunity. The availability of potential development sites creates the ability to design spaces that can accommodate some of the larger format stores um, that couldn't find space in the core of downtown. A and lastly, some of the marketing activities um, in, in trying to position Portland in its retail core and its retail opportunities have been uniquely successful in a very difficult time, with the last year being a prime example. Let me talk to you just a quick second uh, about the process um, that led to this downtown retail strategy started uh, in December of last year. It's pretty fast track. We've got a, we've got a situation that really has to, uh, that requires attention right away. Um, it involves, the steering committee involves uh, slightly more than a dozen people as well as staff and consultants and you add all those folks in and it's, uh, it's more than two dozen. Um, but it, primarily retailers of all types in down, from downtown it's really, f their charge was really to focus on what can happen in the next three to five years, what needs to happen in the next three to five years for us to not only maintain what we've got, but grow the opportunities. And at the same time, what are the priorities? Where do we really need to be spending our time to make, and our resources to have the greatest impact? Um, and who's going to be responsible? I mean, that has unfortunately been a part of, of many of our planning efforts in the past in that uh, we develop wonderful documents that are very analytical and very theoretical, uh, but unfortunately they lack uh, very detailed implementation strategies. And then when there's any, when there's conflict, there tend to be a fair amount of finger pointing as to who's responsible or who didn't do it or who should have. Um, this, this effort attempts to be very specific in that regard with regards to time frame, priority, responsible party, and funding. The strategy itself comes down to 12 recommendations, uh, 12 broad recommendations. Eight of those are clearly head and shoulders above the others. The other four uh, really start the process on a, a longer path that will um, involve more planning, more study, and actually um, push implementation out beyond the five-year horizon. I, I'd like to talk about those 12 uh, recommendations the first one, and, and I would note this was f is far and away from our focus groups, and we had quite a number of those. Uh, we also had a, a public uh, input session. Um, these, most of these meetings have, have been very intense every few weeks, uh, three to four hours at a time. Um, but the very first one uh, that really was far beyond the other recommendations was to retain and strengthen the existing anchor retail uses within the retail core. And that means such things as facilitating the, the renovation of the Myron Frank in its current location, guiding potential future Nordstrom expansion into rather than away from the retail core, analyze and protect future anchor sites, develop and implement specific 
retail, strat rec retail recruitment strategies, and develop additional parking on street and in structures, i.e. underground, um, to address these future needs. The second priority was supporting existing independent retailers. That, in that area, it, involved, it included adopting a citywide policy of no public financial support for development projects that add more than 400,000 square feet of new net retail space at any one time. Not overbuilding the market is another way to, to say that. Second, addressing public nuisance issues. And we're really talking quality of life crimes that impact the enjoyability, the, the livability, and the usefulness of downtown for many of our citizens. Next is creating financial incentives for retention and further development of locally based retailers and restaurants. And develop relocation strategies for local desirable retailers faced with a loss of existing location and lastly, strengthening the, the storefront improvement program. The third recommendation is to improve the existing climate along the transit mall, existing retail climate. The, the recommendations there including allowing auto access and adding very limited strategically placed on-street parking along one side of the transit mall, but doing so in a way that does not preclude the introduction or the addition of light rail or street cars to that space in the short future. Second recommendation in that area was to require or and encourage active uses along transit mall store frontage, encourage active sidewalk uses along the length of the transit mall, develop detailed design and cost estimates of mall improvements, auto access, parking, lighting, pedestrian amenities, active sidewalk uses, and maintenance the full length of the mall on 5th and 6th. The fourth recommendation was to recruit selected retailers and aggressively market the downtown. That includes continuing the recruitment of department stores while it's very clear that if we want to keep Myron Frank, we can't aggressively or reasonably expect to add an additional department store in the next five years. However, many of those decisions take far longer than five years, and that, that time and effort should start now if we anticipate adding an additional department store, which we believe we can support beyond that initial five-year horizon. We need to spend time and effort recruiting single unit or flagship specialty stores, those that are one of a kind to the marketplace or those that are the best or the, the, the most um, uh, inventoried um, of all the stores in the region. We also need to, to build upon the, the designer um, fashion industry that's already downtown by recruiting six to eight complementary branded product stores. We need to focus on new food concepts that are, are either coming to the west coast or rolling out in the states from offshore. And we also need to make sure that, that we conduct annually an inventory of available retail space so that we know what's out there, what's possible, uh, what, the, what the opportunities really are beyond individual buildings. There's also a need for a hardware or a home improvement store to service this growing residential community uh, in the downtown and in the central city. And also there's a need to have a, a, a single point of contact and a, and a coordination in these marketing and promotional efforts for the, this type of, of, uh, of development. The fifth uh, recommendation is to implement the Midtown Park Blocks improvements to support the downtown retail strategy. Included in that particular recommendation are the promotion of an intense market rate residential developments, developments on the close-in blocks facilitating development of the Galleria as a mixed-use project, proceeding with the design and implementation of parks on Park Block 5, O'Brien Square, and streetscape improvements along Southwest 9th and Park Avenue, and finally, and, and critically important to the retailers in that area, resolve the remaining uncertainty over the future of the Midtown uh, blocks. Uh, in short, how much of it is going to be renovation, redevelopment versus open space, and, and when. 
The next recommendation was to increase market rate housing in the downtown area. There's a, an analysis done uh, in Indianapolis back in the late 80s, and it, it's the most uh, quantifiable report in that regard I, I've ever heard. And it, it made the case for um, substantial investments in, in all types of housing in, in downtown Indianapolis. And the conclusion was that uh, housing units, people that live downtown, um, spend better than 70% of their disposable household income on goods and services that are available in the downtown. That's not just disposable consumer items. That includes lawyers, accountants, as well as the dry cleaners and the florists. Um, all of those activities. That's, that compared to people that just um, work downtown, eight to five, nine to five, they spend less than 30% of their household disposable income in the downtown. Um, there is a huge economic benefit for having residents in the downtown area. We have to provide some incentives and some amenities to make that market momentum real. The next recommendation was enhance the environmental and the experience of downtown. This is things like uh, putting in place a wayfinding and directory program, a you are there, a you are here rather uh, type program, and supporting um, uh, anchor projects that uh, like the proposed ice rink at Pioneer Courthouse Square. Those are huge opportunities to, to make downtown easier, more inviting, and more useful to more people. And lastly, of the eight, upgrade Broadway to reflect the important retail avenue that it is. And that includes undertaking Broadway streetscape planning, uh, including an analyzation and revisiting of, of a two-way direction on that street. Um, implement uh, uh, building and specialty holiday lighting programs along the length of that street, and then ultimately implement the streetscape improvements that are agreed upon. Retailing is such an important part of what makes downtown Portland work. It's what makes a, a major part of what makes downtown Portland unique uh, and attractive, quite frankly, uh, not only to those of us who live here, those that work downtown, uh, but to the visitors that come here. If we as a, as a community want to do these things, um, that we've talked about and are willing to engage in the public dialogue and hopefully the public action that's going to be required to sustain this kind of the kind of retail we now enjoy and to actually grow it and grow the benefits that come to our tax base and our community as a whole. Um, we're going to have to come together and we're going to have to step up in addressing some of these difficult issues. The downtown retail strategy was developed not as a plan to sit on a shelf. Um, it's not a plan that was written to win an award. It's a plan that is intended to be implemented. And for the reasons I outlined earlier, the assignment of responsibility, the identification of clear priorities, and definable timelines, we believe that can happen. APP and PDC have both agreed through this process, and as we entered this process together, that we're, we have a willingness on the part of our two agencies to step up to the plate and make sure that the implementation of these important items occur. As I close, I'd like to say how fortunate we are at APP to have a partner in the public sector like the Portland Development Commission, and most importantly, the, the leadership that Don Maziotti brings to that group, uh, his vision, his, uh, his commitment to results, uh, and his, his breadth of experience um, are welcome additions and, quite frankly, make it, it more likely that the things I talked about today will happen. Um, we're committed at, the, at APP and on the, the uh, private uh, sector side to be the best partner we can to the innovation that's uh, at PDC uh, and to making sure that retailing continues and remains a vital and important anchor for downtown Portland now and into the future. Thank you very much for your attention.
Well, Kim and Don, I'm really pleased to hear such planning is taking place because after reading the morning paper and looking at those indices about how Portland is evaluated, whether it's street conditions, it's education, and some other things, I thought it created a great incentive to travel someplace because no matter where you went, it was going to be better than here. <coughs> but, Don, my question is for you. And um, PDC controls a significant amount of money and power in Portland relative to uh, development. And historically, PDC has been known for its disregard for the goals of other city, the city planning bureau and with other bureaus. And the Union Station, I think, is only one example. So under you, I'm, my question is, what is PDC doing to better coordinate with those other agencies for a more harmonious and a better, uh, better design plan? Thanks, Kurt, I think, for that question. <laughs> Um, there is certainly a legacy of tension between the Development Commission as an organization and other city agencies. I think, though, that the, like so many things, the, uh, the legacy sort of overshadows the reality of today. We work uh, very closely and cooperatively, I think, with other city agencies. We don't always see eye to eye. Uh, we are a special purpose government organized differently for a variety of reasons than uh, a city bureau. We're run by a commission that has an orientation and clearly a bias toward development that causes it perhaps to look at things somewhat differently. We are arguably closer to the marketplace, uh, closer to the business community than um, public, strictly public agencies are, and so those things give rise to differences in approach, sometimes differences in philosophy, but I think by and large, uh, today at least, and I, you know, I really can't, well, I could talk about 30 years ago, but uh, I'll focus on today. Uh, I think the relationships are pretty good. Uh, we don't share all the visions. We don't share all the, uh, the work orders. We don't share all of the, necessarily, the mantras that perhaps uh, other agencies have. What we do have, however, is a very strong commitment to the decision-making process in the city. We have uh, total respect for uh, the mayor as our commissioner in charge. I have a great working relationship, I think, with uh, all of the council members, Commissioner Sten, Commissioner Francisconi in particular, with whom I work with closely, Commissioner Salzman on sustainability issues. Uh, you know, I would have to say that in those terms, I think we're in a very strong position. And as far as other organizations, um, I think we have a good relationship with most. Um, and if we're not good, you ought to mark down on my report card that I don't play well with others because there's a, <laughs> there's a space for that. Thanks. <clears throat> Ned Rook, member. One of the things you did not mention, Mr. Kimbrough, was a matter of a sales tax. And I'm curious realizing that a sales tax, if we have one, can't just be an additional sales tax. It's got to be blended in to the other taxes. Uh, exactly how your group stands on, on uh, supporting a sales tax. Bearing in mind, looking at the list of the other cities that we are competing with, that they all do have sales taxes. And if it's going to be a, de I mean, <coughs> a detriment to us, how do we face it and still taking into consideration the city and the state's budgetary problems? Almost an overwhelming need for some kind of a sales tax. The, the, um, we have not taken a, a firm position on um, the, the, the need for a sales tax. Um, we, it would obviously would be much easier just from a reporting standpoint so we can get our hands around what's happening in, in various sectors of the economy. Um, I'm not sure that's the reason alone to have one or not have one. Um, having uh, said that, though, we are many of the same issues that uh, relate to uh, our ability to pay for the things that, that make Portland great and that make that we all enjoy and expect as part of the livability of this, this place we call home uh, has to be examined. And we are participating with the city uh, and the county uh, and the PDC and the uh, Portland Chamber of Commerce 
in a comprehensive analysis of the BIT and BLT um, because there are some substantial inequities there in terms of how that is applied and who pays and who, who pays nothing. Um, and there are some substantial issues there. Those are the, the a bulk of the uh, discretionary dollars that are available to the city and the county other than their mandated uh, uh, baseline programs. And we believe that, that obviously we're going to look at all kinds of options of which the sales tax would be one of those as, as ways to kind of level the playing field, but also um, make sure we're able to pay for those essential services um, that we all expect either as residents or as businesses uh, that are located in the boundaries of the city. Uh, Ray Polani, a City Club member. Uh, those of us that have some gray fair, hair or lost some remember the 70s and the downtown plan. That's really what turned downtown Portland around. The downtown plan was primarily based on three concepts. Increased transit accessibility dramatically, and the transit mall was the vehicle. Uh, the second thing was a parking lid, which uh, remained in effect for quite a number of years, 39,000. And uh, the last component is the one that really didn't quite get off the ground as well, and that was housing in downtown, residents in downtown. I think for good, healthy downtowns, what's needed is people. Residents, people are essential for downtown. You mentioned it, both of you. The question is, don't do anything to the transit mall by adding more automobiles. Rather, increase transit accessibility. <laughs> transit accessibility at this point, with the tremendous success of Max, requires probably undergrounding. And you mentioned the vitality of San Francisco. You mentioned the vitality of Manhattan. I suggest Vancouver, BC, and I suggest Toronto. All of those cities have subways in downtown, and all of those cities have more residents in downtown. That should be your plan. That should be your plan. How to underground uh, uh, transit in downtown to provide more capacity and more speed, and also how to add resident population. What do you plan to do about that? <laughs> 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 I'd be happy to answer. Please, John. Um, I think we can connect the two questions. If we're going to do anything underground of that scale, Ray, we would definitely need a sales tax. <laughs> <laughs> I was here uh, at the time, Ray, when you were and still are so active in, as an advocate for, at that time, vintage trolleys, and in fact worked on the housing legislation which provided a 10-year tax exemption for housing built in certain areas of 300,000 people or more in the state of Oregon. Um, and there was a good deal of housing investment in fact done by Jack Salzman. You may remember Jack was really a pioneer uh, in building well over 3,000 housing units in downtown during that era. And Ned, you were probably chief counsel or some such at Portland Development Commission during that era. I think we need to find ways to uh, revisit the days when we provided incentives to generate both market rate housing as well as uh, the kinds of housing that are necessary for middle and low income people. And I think we're there. I think we know what we need to do. I think we know the number of units that are desirable. The retail strategy folks told us 2,500 market level units are absolutely essential for the health of the downtown going forward the next five years. And now I think it's time that we get about the business and quit arguing about, you know, how many numbers do we need and have we done a good job. Wayman Winston, who's the Director of Housing for the Portland Development Commission, is here, highly experienced hand. He and Molly Bordenaro, who happens to be a, a new board member of Fannie Mae, which is the largest mortgage origination company in the world, uh, are working together to find a solution for exactly that issue. And I, you know, I'm de totally dedicated to it, as well as the no-net housing policy that uh, Eric Sten has uh, shepherded through council. So we'll get there, and I agree with you. Erwin Mandel, City Club member. A question for Mr. Kimbrough. My wife and I are downtown residents, and uh, we have some discretionary income from time to time. We do spend it downtown. Uh, 
But something we have been involved in for a number of years is your clean and safe program, particularly the safe aspect of it, from the days of EID and to at May and PPI and the present PPI. However, we are we and other people, and I speak to residents downtown, are concerned about the merger between APP and the Chamber of Commerce and what effect this will have on the safe part of the Clean and Safe program, which has been very effective, particularly since it's my understanding there hasn't been a new contract with the present owners of PPI, has still been hanging. And as we talk to the people on the street of PPI, the morale is not at its peak. And that's probably a bit of British understatement at, for the moment. Uh, and we are really concerned about the efficiency, effectiveness, and morale of the people of PPI, and what are your plans for it? The, um, the short answer is that there will be no change. Um, the, um, the coming together of APP and the Chamber is actually going to create some tremendous opportunities in some very specific areas, those being advocacy and doing it much more, much more professionally, much more focused with much more potential and many more resources attached to that. It also will attract, will focus on uh, enhancing the successes that we enjoy here in Portland, both in the business community and as a community in national and international publications. It also will focus on helping grow the, the new economy, um, the biotech, um, the information economy, the industries of the mind of all types, um, it, it, making sure that Portland's not left out of that loop and left behind. Other than those additions, there is nothing at APP, including the premier program that we call Clean and Safe, that will change, will be left behind. In fact, we believe it will be continue to be enhanced as it has been for every year that it's been in existence. Um, I, I am not surprised by the, uh, some of the morale problems. We've heard them ourselves on the part of the, the individuals on the streets. And much of that has to do with some very difficult challenges that this community is facing. Uh, and, that, and you're going to hear a whole lot more about this in the, the weeks ahead. And that has to do with the ability of this community to pay for our public safety network, including community justice and all of the wonderful programs that, that, that they provide, but also the, the issue of jail beds and the issue of resources to properly move individuals through those two respective processes. There are some substantial financial constraints there. Um, as well as at the, the police bureau, and all of those translate into some of the lower level crimes that sometimes escalate into to more serious offenses not being a, addressed as aggressively or as frequently as we all might expect or, or like. Um, and most, many of those don't deserve, nor should they be, uh, incarcerated. There are alternative ways to, to, to help those individuals and address the problems that cause the offenses. It's an issue of resources. And, and let's also not forget, whether you like it or don't like it, the, um, uh, the uh, drug-free zones and the changes that the courts have just wrought on us in terms of how those work um, and, and ha have essentially broken the morale of some of those officers because right now, in instead of trying to help those individuals get into or locate um, the services that they need in many instances to get off the street, they're prohibited from, from intervening. And so it, it, I, I don't discount at all what you say, and we're all going to have to put our collective heads together and our collective wills to address those broader system-wide societal issues that trickle down to our ability to continue to do what we've done so well since the mid-1980s. But thank you for those comments on how successful Clean and Safe is, because we totally agree with you. It was one of the first in the country. Thank you. John Leeper, City Club member. I'm aware that the title of the program today is The Health of Our Central City. However, as a resident of Washington County, I say to myself, how can you have a vibrant, growing, healthy central city 
without the other surrounding areas also enjoying that health. And I haven't heard any recognition from either of you about any part of the overall Portland community other than the central city. And I would just like your comments or reaction to that. Well, let me give recognition to uh, what may have been missing from my discussion of downtown. Uh, downtown Portland is successful, among other things, because of the neighborhoods and communities that surround it. Um, it provides the identity for our region. And in fact, it is the lightning rod for the image that we project to the rest of the world. Let there be no doubt about that. It is also very clear and becomes clear every day that the surrounding communities are extraordinarily important to our future. And just a week ago, the West Side Alliance um, revealed the results of their analysis of the West Side, um, largely Washington County, which is the principal economic dr driver uh, of this region in terms of value-added exports. And value-added exports are what create wealth uh, and jobs and investment. The Portland Development Commission uh, is dedicated to assisting our regional partners. In fact, we have and we administer the Regional Partners Program, which is a consortium of 33 economic development organizations from not only the Oregon side of this metropolitan area, but also the Washington side of the metropolitan area. We work together closely on a day-to-day -day basis, and we frankly serve as the uh, first point of contact at the Development Commission for all 33 communities for purposes of industrial and business recruitment. And we share with them equally the business information that we have. We don't discriminate among and between those folks in Portland or outside of Portland. Uh, they hire us actually on service contracts to work for them, and we do. And so, you know, you point out a really important thing. We're part of a metropolitan community. And metropolitan community is absolutely essential to the future. And, and our health and the health of uh, the overall community is uh, definitely that which will take us to the future. I think the merger of APP and the chamber are another signal of a recognition of a reality that metropolitanism uh, has really defined urban areas today and will in the future. And we're making changes to accommodate that. Kim, I'd, I'd like to hear your point of view. Downtown can't be an island. Um, if we think we are, um, our days are numbered. It's, um, Don's absolutely correct in that uh, while one of the, the major focuses and tenets of the merger of APP and the Chamber is a continued uh, focus on the livability and the vi vitality of downtown Portland, but it also recognizes that uh, we're a part of a, of a larger uh, area and a larger uh, 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 opportunity and that is echo in many of Don's comments um, downtown is really the lightning rod we are the image to the world um, so goes downtown so goes the region um, it is rare in this uh, country of ours that it is the, the opposite is true um, so uh, we, we tend to believe that our focus continues to be on downtown and as a result it will continue to pay the benefits and the dividends that Portlanders have enjoyed for the last 25 years.